Thanks, Mel. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, TreeNet. Um, welcome to Mitcham. Welcome to University of Adelaide. Um, permeable paving and infiltration systems. You, you get the concept. We've got a few problems. This is Goodwood Road, just down the hill here in Mitcham, a couple of years ago. Urbanisation, I'm not telling you anything new. Colonel Light Gardens, heritage listed suburb. A few houses have been extended in the last few decades, but generally it's been built pretty much for 100 years. We're getting this sort of storm event in Colonel Light Gardens. Runoff has increased, infiltrations decreased. We started looking at that, um, starting to, to look at increasing infiltration through permeable paving through other devices. We, we've only just started to look at it. We don't have all the answers. We haven't even asked all the questions. I'm positive we'll get some questions today direct us into areas that we haven't thought of. Um, that's normal, it's very early days. So if you're after all the answers, <laughs> you'll go home disappointed. We're, we're really just exposing what we've been doing the last few years. We've made some mistakes, we've got some results that look promising. Uh, today, I get to talk about the boring bits, a bit of theory, and then Russell kicks in with the, the exciting stuff, building stuff, uh, making it work, and You'll see a lot of that in the tour this afternoon. Uh, what got me interested was the, the impact of tree roots on impervious surfaces. We were pulling up a lot of broken footpaths, killing a lot of trees, and doing it all again on a, a 10 to 20 year cycle, depending on the species and the pavement. So I'm an arborist, that, that's my interest. Engineering's just something I'm learning along the way to grow better trees. There's a great relationship between trees and engineering. Trees can actually make our engineering a lot more sustainable and a lot more productive and cost efficient. So that's the way we're looking. So when we first proposed building some permeable paving 10 years ago, um, we were told they clog and don't work. You can't use them on reactive soils because you'll get ground movement and the sky will fall in. Um, infiltration into clay doesn't work, it's too slow. Um, we were told they can't take heavy traffic loads and we were told tree roots are a major problem with all paving regardless. So we started to look at that from the tree, tree root perspective and the, the things you find along the way. Clogging, um, we haven't studied clogging. If you get onto the, the literature, and that's one of the best bits of postgrad studies. You get access to all the journals worldwide. You don't have to go and do experiments, you just read it. People have done it. Uh, on the left, as installed, 2009, some Adbury Eco Trihex. Five years later, yeah, it looks like they clog up. There's a build up of fines there, some moss. So they do clog, yeah, by observation, anecdotally. What sort of effect does that have? Well, you can actually measure it. You use an infiltrometer, basically a tank, a double ring on the right there. You fill up inside and outside. You measure the, the rate of fall of the head inside. Um, the outer ring just reduces the, the edge effect slightly. So you can actually measure how these pavements are performing at construction or any time down the track. Um, here's some Pezzaniti Beach and Kandasami, some locals from UniSA. Uh, measured in 1999, again in 2006, and you can see as constructed, is there a pointer here? You're getting two and a half metres or, or one metre infiltration rate per hour. One, one metre of water going through those pavers per hour when constructed. And you see it drops off fairly quickly. So yeah, they do clog. They do slow down. Should that stop you using it? Think of this, asphalt paving, pavement road. You drove on asphalt pavement to get here. Asphalt pavement fails across Adelaide every day. We can take a walk within half a kilometre here and find big sections of asphalt paving failing. But you wouldn't consider not using it. Permeable paving's new. There's a hint that it might fail, so you don't go there. There's a problem there. We're not suggesting it's going to suit every application, not advocating that at all, but it's another tool you've got. It's another colour in your palette. Um, some of us here ride bikes. You wouldn't want to ride a 
bike across a, a paved bike track too far. Smooth asphalt's the way to go, yeah. especially on the harder tyres. So horses for courses. Think of a, a car park, um, Marion Westfield. If you built the parking stations out of permeable paving, they'll pick up all of the oil. Most of the pollutants won't get out. They'll actually pick up most of the water that can flow off the asphalt through the roadways through the car park. You might have the footpaths done in concrete. It's just another tool. If you did that, you wouldn't need signs. You could guide people intuitively. So it does have its applications. And we need to think about where we can use it. And we need to get away from the mindset of don't use it because it might fail. Well, everything we use fails. Let's find out where it's best used, where it fails least, where it's most cost effective. Uh, if you do enough of these tests, like the Germans do, they've done hundreds, they've been using permeable paving since the 80s, you can see that it does still drop off fairly quickly. And after about 10 years, you're down to below 20% of the as-constructed infiltration rate. And there's a fairly, fairly consistent sort of variation there. So when you're designing your pavement, don't design for the as-installed, design for 10% or less and you'll cover your bases. After 10 years, it's fairly consistent. There's a lot of build-up of organic in there. Organic's great. It oxidises. It disappears. It goes back into the atmosphere as CO2. That oxidation, that decomposition, keeps the build-up of fines in your paving porous. So it gets to a constant level after 10 years and maintains that. There's some exceptions. Um, if you've got a lot of sand blowing in down the coast, fine sand will choke it. Um, if you've got a, clay, uh, a development site nearby, clay soil disturbed, trucks dragging clay out, yeah, you can block it up, it will need cleaning. So environmental factors, but generally, in a relatively clean, stable environment, established suburb, work on about 10% of as constructed infiltration rate, and you won't go wrong, you'll get a 30 to 40 year life out of it. Here's some New South Wales studies. I told you this was the boring, tedious stuff. We'll get to the good stuff fairly soon. But if you look at the infiltration rates after 11 years, 10 years, there's 282 millimetres of water going through a 10-year clogged permeable pavement. Yeah, they do clog. They can only take uh, a Darwin torrent. Y you won't see that in Adelaide. It's not going to cause you any grief. Um, there's one or two here that were fairly light on, 27 millimetres um, and a 70. 70 millimetres in an hour in Adelaide is more or less a one in a hundred. So even as clogged after 10 years, incident rainfall, it can handle a one in a hundred. So yeah, it does clog. Is it a problem? Probably not. Here's some local examples. Um, Charles Sturt Council, Grange, um, Largs, Woodville. This is where it gets really interesting. Um, the high point in a car park. So you've got water sheeting off asphalt onto permeable paving. So it's not incident rainfall, it's got a catchment. And it's down to 16 millimetres an hour after 10 years. 16 millimetres an hour, it's still a fairly sizeable rainfall event. And this is in its clogged state. But the same car park at a lower point, 240 millimetres an hour. So you've got water sheeting off a car park onto the permeable paving. The high bit gets the runoff. That's clogged first. Water's continuing to sheet. Lower down, infiltration rate's much, much greater. Some locals from UniSA where I was fortunate to study. Um, done a lot of these investigations. You see here the first flow clogging the, the initial section. Further down the car park, infiltration still happening. Fairly rapid through the screenings. Um, you can design what they're calling a clogging front, the span of the area you pave, um, based on the 10-year the infiltration rate. You can design a permeable paving to last 30, 40 years under standard suburban conditions with no maintenance. You don't need to clean it out, you don't need to vacuum, you don't need to lift and relay. And you don't need to do the tests because they've already been done. Um, I like Bugard, the um, Dutchman at the bottom. Studies shown performance of clogged permeable pavement systems is still acceptable many years after many years of service. 
So clogging is a furphy. We don't need to go there. Design for the lower level. Adbury's Eco Trihex, some on the back table here. As installed, eight metres per hour, give or take, infiltration rate. 10%, 800 millimetres per hour infiltration rate. So if you want to design for a one in 80, uh, for an 80 millimetre infiltration, a one in 100, your permeable paving can still have 10 times its area in catchment. So if you pave one tenth of your car park with that one, the whole car park, one in 100, should still filter through. See, they do slow down a bit, but it's not a problem. Clogging front. Uh, Another local study showed that the majority of the sediment causing the clogging is at the surface in the permeable paving. That's, that's what we found. Um, it's, we, we lifted out some eco trihex after five years. You can see there's a build up of organics, there's some moss growing on it. That varied from five to nine millimetres deep after five years. After 10 years, it might be a little bit thicker. Does it clog? No, moss isn't waterproof. Anyone doesn't believe me yet, and I'm gonna stop harping on about this. Next time you get a drip in your roof coming through your ceiling, go out to the street, sweep up some fines, a little bit of moss, a bit of grit, and go up and try and seal your leak with road grime. <laughs> See how effective it is. Do they clog? No, nah, it slows down a bit, but you, you won't stop your drip with it. Trees just need a drip over winter. Uh, it's, it's all about trees. Ground movement. People told me you can't use permeable paving because you put water into our reactive clays and they react. Yeah, they do. They react anyway. How much do they react? With complete access to all the world's journals in my studies, I couldn't find one study that looked at ground movement in relation to permeable paving. So I broadened it and looked at ground movement in relation to any infiltration device. No. I thought I must be doing something wrong. I'm a student, I go and ask the academics, people who've geotechnical engineers, 30, 40 years experience. Can you recall any study ever looking at this? No. So it's probably based on assumption, based on the shrink swill index as an Australian standard. You take a soil from a development site, you wet it, you dry it, you watch how it moves. Yeah, clays expand when they're wet and they shrink when they're dry, but how it works in practice, no one's ever looked at it before much. Back in 2003, our Minister of Planning came out with a, an amendment for on-site retention of stormwater. Put your stormwater into the ground. The leaky well design you see on the back there, on the page 13, is pretty much what TreeNet's adopted. The plumbing at the top's changed, the, the inlet from the gutter, um, maybe an inlet from a, a domestic outflow, <coughs> but basically a, an augured hole, pipe down the centre, feed the stormwater into it, screenings around the outside, it soaks into the ground, shallow infiltration. Um, this was the minister's design for use on private property with a few guidelines around reactive soils and around not within three metres of your neighbour's boundary, things like that. But it was advocated at state level as a possibility back in 2003. Has anyone done it? Mm, not much. Uh, lack of studies. There was one unpublished report on a preliminary study at UniSA. Um, there was a, a council building, seasonal movement, minor cracking. One side of the building was sealed with a paved car park, the other was lawn. So they took stormwater into infiltration trenches into the lawn. It was basically that leaky well but linear rather than circular. And the seasonal rainfall, every time there was a shower of rain, it was into a soakage trench by the building. And they checked the footings levels around that building a few times a year and they found that where the car park was sealed there was no infiltration. It rise in winter, fall in summer, a big sine curve, seasonal wave, annual wave. 
and the design movement for that building was about 60 millimetres and this movement was about 90. So every year it exceeded the design movement for the footing. The other side where they were putting in stormwater, lots more oscillations, but all well within the design load, design movement. So smaller variations, never exceeded. Um, that wasn't published, unfortunately. But that's what they concluded. The trench appears to stabilise ground movements. So the only hint of a study says the sky's not going to fall in, but no one was doing it. They thought it might. So when we built our permeable paving, we built a couple of designs. One's standard level gravel base, 150 millimetres thick. We thought we'd be smart and create a swale under the footpath, expecting water to concentrate here and root growth to concentrate here. They're more expensive to build. It didn't work. Don't go there. Just build the simple level base. It works really well. There's loads more on that that I won't bore you with. It's in the thesis if you want some bedtime reading. So standard paving. You see they're only small sections. They're four metres long, two metres wide. And we measured ground movement at that point there. If this soakage over that point, eight square metres, Adelaide's rainfall, 560 millimetres a year, you're expecting four kilolitres to go into that section of verge. This is moderately reactive, three to four percent shrink swell index, putting four kilolitres in there in an average year. Did it heave? Did it crack the infrastructure? That was 2011, I think, that photo. It was built in 2009. That's the ground movement we got over three years. Um, you can see greatest heave was 30 millimetres from the starting point. Greatest settlement was about 25. The greatest movement we saw at any one site was 50 millimetres, up and down seasonally. Um, it's over three years. But what's interesting here, seven, eight and nine are one of each pavement type. There's your standard impermeable pavement, there's a level based permeable pavement and there's the swale based. And you can see the movement's identical. And this, this graph shows the greatest extent of movement over the, the course of the study. And that is the highest point minus the low point. So that's the extent, greatest extent of movement at each of the sites, 18 sites down the street, 300 metres of roadside. The greatest was 50 odd millimetres. Um, you kind of get the impression with a shape like that, it's <coughs> not impacted by the pavement type whatsoever. It's more a function of the site and external conditions. The soil varies slightly down the, the street. The amount of reactive soil is probably greatest. The, the, the profile isn't parallel. There's, there's a greater depth of reactive soil at sites um, four to nine. And also there were more trees at four to nine, trees drawing the moisture. We see more seasonal movement. So pavement had no effect on ground movement whatsoever in that study. Uh, other sites, same thing. What got really interesting though, you get a, a world-class statistician working with you and they say, oh, you can account for these external effects. So you quantify the proximity and the size of the trees and you can make allowance for the, the moisture there drawing. And what gets really interesting, we, we gave that a, a name called the, the shade factor. Higher shade, more trees closer to the experiments. So this is trees with uh, a site, sites with no trees nearby and you see the, the control pavement which is a standard villa stone impermeable pavement from our starting reference, the movement was fairly minor. It got up to in the 20s millimetres, but it was all positive. So, so maximum movement for the standard footpath, 20 millimetres, if you allow for the external effects, the tree influences. And the permeable had slightly greater movement where there's no trees, getting more evaporation and more infiltration. But where you had a few trees in proximity, not many, just, just a scattering, moderate shade factor, there's no difference. And where you've got 
a lot of trees overhanging nearby, so within twice their height of the, the site. The, the opposite is true to the case for the, the perm, um, impermeable paving. The blue, the level, uh, sorry, the, the permeable swale design had least movement. So if you account for the, the external effects, permeable pavement does influence ground movement. But if you want trees in the equation, permeable paving actually reduces the, mound move, the ground movement, doesn't increase it. So if you want a stable street, no trees, use a sealed pavement. If you want less ground movement with trees, use a permeable pavement. Statistically significant differences, but in reality the total movement's 50 millimetres and the differences here are 10 or less millimetres. So use what you like, it makes no difference. Bottom line. Uh, too much tedium, sorry about that, we'll get to Russell soon. Infiltration, we didn't study that. So many studies done, you know, the heavier the clay gets, the lower the infiltration rates. Studies overseas, many of them now. Um, even on clay rich soils, relatively slow infiltration rates, best management practices, infiltration, permeable paving are still effective. Um, American Society of Civil Engineers. Up to the 10 year, 24 hour ARI, even on steep slopes over impermeable soils and subject to frequent rainfall, permeable paving is still effective at addressing storm flows. You can infiltrate. So take it up with the American Society for Civil Engineers if you don't believe it. Um, what interests me, um, tree roots. Don't think of tree roots only as um, guy wires, supporting structures. Think of them as organic, leaky pipes. They transfer water from high potential to low potential. You've got high suction in a dry clay soil. It will actually suck water from a wet part of the root system on the other side of the tree through the root zone, through metres overnight, and the soil will actually draw it back out of the roots. Tree roots function as leaky organic pipes. So instead of two to three millimetres an hour infiltration in heavy clays overnight, Tree stomates close, so you're not getting a net drawer out. It can draw across the root system. It can draw from deep to shallow, shallow to deep, or lateral. You can get many metres of infiltration overnight if you put a tree in there. That's huge. We haven't started to look at that yet. But you can expose a tree net leaky well to 1,000 cubic metres of soil through an oak tree, mature oak tree root system. So you might increase the moisture content this much. So you're not going to get saturation, you're not going to get stability problems, it's going to be dispersed overnight. Uh, deciduous trees drop their leaves, system comes into equi equilibrium in autumn, tries to maintain equilibrium right through until leaf burst in spring. So you've got four or five months of heavy rainfall where that tree is transporting water underground, recharging the dry soil at the extremities of the root system. Trees are good, really enhance the effectiveness of our engineering systems. This is where I get interested. Tree roots. That's not a tree. That is a tree. And most tree roots, we're told, grow up. The roots that absorb the water, absorb the nutrients dissolved in the water, are as thick as your hair, and they last maybe six months. They turn over. So they'll grow up where conditions are good, right sort of um, environment, soil, um, oxygen, soil moisture, soil porosity. They'll last six months, maybe a year. They'll absorb what they can. They die, like leaves. Um, then you get that hair-like tunnel. The root decays. You've got a, a biopore, increase infiltration, increase oxygenation. Tree roots are really good. Um, we come along and build a road, we cut roots out, we put a trench in with a pipe and we pave a footpath. We, we, we impact our trees. Uh, tree roots and paving. Tree roots need oxygen, they need moisture. 
they need pore space to divide into. They, they can't develop too much pressure at the tip where the tip divides and the root extends in length. Often the greatest pore space is in the sand under the paving. The only moisture in summer is condensate on the base of the paving when the paving cools in the evening. High humidity in the soil. So the roots track along under your paving and do this. There's one in Tea Tree Gully, 10 year old trees, 10 year old pavement, written off. Uh, this is what we had in the street we started studying. Again, tracking under, in the sand, looking at the, the moisture, taking the moisture out. That's the result. We rip out both. That, that pavement was nine years old at that stage. There you see, compacted subgrade, tree roots can't penetrate, no pore space. Moisture and sand, perfect environment for roots. Roots grow along the surface, can't penetrate, lift paving up. So we thought permeable paving built on a gravel base on uncompacted soil might provide a solution. Uh, that's actually a level base. We had to grade the top to match the surrounding. Um, and surprise, surprise, most roots grow up. We got root growth into the screenings from the subgrade beneath. These are from the, the trees we planted five years earlier. And what's really promising, most roots grow up here when conditions are good. Um, you can see the fine roots here. Probably can't see from there. If you get really close, you can sometimes see the, the hair-like roots coming off the sides of them. But what's impressive there is that section there and these brown flecks. That's decaying roots from last season. It gets really hot here, really dry every summer, the roots die. So you get autumn, winter, spring, roots die. These roots are never going to damage that paving. The gravel provides a buffer. In this, this climate, that's a, a Manchurian pear tree. It's not going to damage the paving if we use permeable paving. If it was a fig tree in Brisbane where they grow aerial roots, it's not going to work. We need to do more study, see what the limitations are. But with our climate here where the gravel dries out, many of the species we use probably won't damage paving. We won't be out fixing pavers after 10 years. We won't have claims from people breaking their noses or hips where they've tripped over. Life cycle costs will go down. We need to work out which trees this works for and how we use them and the optimum base design. We haven't started any of that yet, but we're getting there. Um, you can see the fine roots in the gravel coming from slightly larger roots here. Uh, actually penetrated through the, the geotextile, growing upwards seasonally into the gravel, dying off in summer. Most of these um, dead to about here. That node will probably re-sprout next autumn. So this, this is exciting. This is natural root growth under engineered footpath. This has to be better for trees. We've got no data on it yet, but it's working as in nature. The root growth under the ground, you lift the geotextile, that's what you see. Empty tracks where roots have been. That's what I was talking about, the turnover, seasonal turnover. So each one of those tracks is a pore for water and oxygen. You see at the end of those tracks, there's a biopore goes down to who knows what depth. So infiltration is greatly increased. Instead of a compacted surface that roots can't penetrate, that gets saturated because water can't penetrate, a saturated silky clay has a lower strength than drained silty clay that's not compacted. So which is better for your paving? Um, interesting. We didn't stop at the surface. We started to look at root growth down the profile. We measured every root we dug up in nine sites. Uh, in the shallowest zone, 200 millimetres deep, these are the coarse roots, the, the, the roots that are starting to expand, the ones that are going to do damage to your paving if they keep going. There's a lot less of them under the permeable level pavement than under the standard pavement. So not only does the gravel provide a buffer against root damage to your footpath, in permeable paving. In the soil beneath them, the roots are actually deeper. 
So you've got more room to move twice. So you're not going to damage your pavement. If you need to do some adjustment, you're not going to need to kill the tree. Uh, fine roots, there's more of them in the shallows. And these are the ones that aren't going to do any damage. We did this excavation midwinter so we didn't harm the tree. Probably some of those roots disappear and probably start to grow down. We, we need to test that. So the seasonal growth up in autumn, winter, spring, down over summer, otherwise the tree wouldn't be getting any water. So it's cyclical growth. Um, it's not reported anywhere in urban areas. No one's done this research yet. Um, you mentioned, uh, yeah, the paper's been lifted up 10 years or so, yeah. non permeable How long have you had permeable ones in and have you seen any lifting of them over the 10 years? Yes, we have. Um, permeable's not the answer to everything. One of these sites in East Parade uh, has some massive Australian natives, lilypilly, fig, those sorts of things in the garden nearby. And those roots have come into the permeable zone, um, actually at the boundary. One's come in through the impermeable and one's come in through the permeable. And the lift is about the same. But in the permeable, it's dropped off within four or 500 of the edge. So it's probably induced deeper root growth. Very similar with the impermeable. It's very close to the edge. I suspect it might be getting the benefit. It hasn't tracked along under the, the paving. But it's early days. That's a, a job for a couple of weeks' time to actually lift and, and start to measure that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, that gravel underlay, is that something that you guys developed? Does that become a standard? No, no, no. Back in the 80s, some environmental health people reported that a gravel layer was one of the best deterrents for root growth. They were burying um, low-level toxic and radioactive waste in a, a strip. Strip excavation, rubbish goes in, cap it, clay cap, put some trees on to stop erosion and dust and the trees were pulling the toxins back up. So they looked into it in the 80s. They used a 600 millimetre deep layer of coarse stone, gravel, scoria they used in some of them, um, and then put the clay cap on top of that. There's geotextile in there as well. And they found it solved their problem. The roots got to the gravel and didn't penetrate. Um, that was in the 80s. In the 90s, there were some researchers in the US and Europe putting a gravel layer under a poured concrete path. Just put 150 mil of gravel, pour concrete straight on top. Uh, it didn't go through, they'd finished the concrete and they were measuring tree on one side, measuring root depth on the other. They found the root depth increased because the gravel dries out, it doesn't support root growth. Uh, so we looked at those two and we thought, oh, there was a conference in the late 90s, Kim, Professor Kim Coder said, Gravel is the best root deterrent we've found, but developers don't use it for whatever reason. Uh, so we looked at that and thought, well, permeable paving has a gravel layer. Let's try that. And it works. Tim, you mentioned that <coughs> you found that uh, you had water transfer by roots. Yep. Do you, um, do you know the mechanism of that? Is that happening along the roots or is that happening in the roots? Um, you repeat the question tonight. So we were, the question goes to uh, movement of soil moisture by tree roots. Uh, the, the term that's written up in the literature is hydraulic redistribution. Early days it was referred to as hydraulic lift. Uh, it's where a, a tree root system covers a, a range of soil moisture levels. And the, the tree roots transfer water from where it's abundant to where it's scarce. The system comes into equilibrium, basically. Good question. Um, which species of trees work best with permeable paving here in Adelaide? We've tested one, Pyrus caleriana. Uh, it works for that. Um, beyond that, we'd be guessing. Uh, we need to test them. We could do that in laboratory, in glasshouse tests, um, greenhouse tests. Um, it would only take a couple of years that way to test a, a whole range of species. Do you think there's likely to be a pattern as to whether <coughs> are natives or exotics or deciduous or non-deciduous? You know, do you think there's likely to be one or the other? Or 
again, no data, but I don't suspect there'd be a distinction like that. It would come down to species and climate. Stone size may be a limitation as well as the stone decreases in size. It may not become as effective. But we need to test all this. Don't know, early days. We haven't got the answers. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Tim.